Yes, welcome to worship on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's good to be together as the family of God. Would you stand, please, as we sing Heart of the Glad Sound? <laughs>
shake away to go tell it on the mountain. this morning that there's a, uh, a fair chunk of grub sitting up here and that's a good thing uh, and uh, I want to say thank you to Diana who coordinated this and put together the advent reverse advent calendar and got the bags and all that stuff so uh, and I know that Diana wants to say something I don't even know where she is oh there she is and I want to invite Leona and whoever you all brought with you to come on up so that we can uh, bless you with this stuff. St. Paul's, I am so proud of you. We had 30 bags. She's channeling her inner Sorry. Donna, apparently. Yeah, we miss Donna. Um, and my mother. Anyway, um, we had 30 bags. And last Sunday, they were gone. So congratulations. Your generosity never ceases to overwhelm me, and you've done it again. The front is almost impossible <laughs> because it is so full. And so um, this, this blessing goes to the food bank for, use, for you folks uh, through the year. And it's just something that we can do. Thank you for what you do in our community. If you missed the bags <laughs> or you lost your calendar, um, I have it in an email copy. 
I can send it to you and I would say any time in 2020 you could bring that in um, and we can do that. And if you haven't had an opportunity, there are also daily readings uh, that go through on the scripture passages um, that I've been putting up and they have been shared so far across the province this, uh, this season. It's been really cool to see the traffic that comes to the church's website, but also um, the readings. And uh, so if you can on Facebook, get that. If you want hard copies of it, I can get that to you as well. But if you want the calendar and you missed it, uh, please don't miss the opportunity. I will happily email it to you, and um, we can talk about that after the service. Thanks. You're probably going to need a hand carrying this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, c- come and face the, the, these crazy people here who love you so much. Uh, we are glad to be your partners. Uh, always have been, right from day one, from long before I got here. Mm-hmm. And uh, we hope that this is uh, a blessing to the folks who are in need. And uh, we want to bless you too, but do you want to say anything before I do that? can't be much more eloquent than Diane was, but we do appreciate everything that St. Paul's does for us. I mean, from putting up with, again, the mess that we make and uh, we try to clean up as best we can, um, to not only the food offerings that you give us and the space, but furniture as well for our, our people that need it in times. I, I really can't tell you how much it means to me personally, to Angela, to Sabine, um, that, that you are partners with us and uh, we consider you as we hope you consider us part of the family. I wish you all the very, very best for the upcoming year as the need for food really grows. Last year when I, we stood here, we had 45 families registered in the Nobleton area. Um, as I stand here today, we have 73 families that are taking advantage of the food bank in the Nobleton area alone. So for, from them and from us, thank you so very, very much. Can I pray for you? Yes, please. Father, we're grateful for the generosity of your people. And frankly, we're pretty saddened by the need that we need to do that. But we pray that these gifts will make a difference in the lives of those who do have need, that this (coughs) hand up will make a difference for them. And we thank you for these friends who serve who uh, month in and month out, and in some cases day in and day out, are giving of themselves and their time to aid those who have need. Bless them, strengthen them, encourage them in their work, and help them to realize that this work that they do is work that indeed you call them to do, something that's near and dear to your heart. So we pray for the families and individuals who will receive the food, that they will receive your blessing with it. And for these friends who give it out, that they will know that they are not only our partners, but your partners in this work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you. And uh, we we will give you a hand to get rid of it. Just a few things that I'll draw to your attention by way of announcement this morning. Uh, The first is to remind you that if you haven't picked up your envelopes for 2020 and you are someone who prefers to give by envelope, they are out in the lobby and uh, Irma will help you if you don't have any. There's also other ways to give, of course, which are noted. Uh, The snow shoveling schedule is up and still has some blank spaces in it, including those coveted ones in April that usually involve no work. (laughs) So please feel free to sign up for uh, even just a week to help out with snow shoveling. And the other is just to let you know that Christmas services come up uh, this week on Tuesday evening, 
6.30 for kids and their families and 8 o'clock in a more contemplative way. My encouragement to you is to walk here if you can, but if you can't walk here, please park as far away from the doors as you can so that there is priority parking for our guests because that's uh, the night that we tend to get a lot of guests and the easier it is for them to park, the uh, more likely they are to be encouraged to come back. So that's a good habit to get into. And then Christmas Day, of course, at 10 o'clock, we'll be here for carols and communion, and you're welcome to attend any or all of those because they're all completely different, each one. There's not even a rerun sermon between the three of them, so it's, uh, even if there was, it wouldn't be all that bad. We're going to have the lighting of the fourth Advent candle, and Linda is going to take care of that, and Luke's going to help, or Luke's going to take care of that, and Linda's going to help. I'm not sure which. But we very carefully, clinically tested all of our lighters this week. And we are confident that, uh, that they'll work. Hey. <clears throat> Jesus is the light of the world. Light no darkness can ever put out. Today we light the first, second, third, and fourth candle of Advent. The first candle shines hope. And the second candle shines peace. The third candle shines joy. And the fourth candle shines love. And then if we all can join in the reading. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that anyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal lasting life. Jesus said to them, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love Lord Jesus, who loved us to the end, open our hearts that we may receive your love and show the love to the world. Amen. Irene's going to read for us from Proverbs 19. Good morning. Keep the commandments and keep your life. Despising them leads to death. If you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord, and he will repay you. Discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. Hot-tempered people must pay the penalty. If you rescue them once, you will have to do it again. Get all the advice and instruction you can, so you will be wise the rest of your life. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Thank you. In a moment, we're going to receive the Lord's offering as an opportunity for us to uh, respond to God's goodness in our lives, and uh, I'll invite those who are going to receive the offering to come forward. As you know, in this season of the year, we invite you to give over and above what you normally would give in tithes and offerings to a special Christmas offering with this envelope which is in your bulletin. Uh, and this benefits not only some unique ministry in the congregation but also some of the important work in our community. We've mentioned the food bank already which we aid tangibly uh, in this way but also can aid them monetarily. And another is Victory House which is uh, uh, the work of Pat Valliere and uh, those who work with her uh, in Caledon to build a home that will provide refuge for women and children in times of crisis. These are ministries that are near and dear to the heart of Jesus and so near and dear to us as well. Our goal is to raise $5,000 by the end of the month and uh, as of last Sunday we had raised just under 1700 so we have a way to go but I know that we can do this. Let's pray. 
Father, we offer you our gifts because we can't possibly undertake all of your work individually on our own. What we give enables us to partner with others to fulfill your vision for this world. Bless us as we give and bless even more those who will use these gifts to do your work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's offering will be received and will remain seated as we say, joy has dawned. Let's pray together. O Lord of history, we come before you in worship and in praise today. We come to declare your glory and pro proclaim your love and your mercy and your grace. We come to honor you and to exalt the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, from eternity past, you determined 
to redeem a lost and wretched humanity. From eternity past, Jesus chose to pay the price of that redemption. Throughout history, the prophets spoke of your promise to send a deliverer, a savior, a king. And during this season and throughout the year, we celebrate the miracle of the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who left his throne of glory to take on the form of a man, to walk among us sinless, proclaiming the gospel of salvation through faith in him. And then, Father, in an act of unspeakable love, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, bearing the full weight of your wrath so that we would have eternal life. And then, in the glory of your power, he rose from the grave, defeating sin and death, and now he ever lives as our high priest and intercessor. What a blessed reality it is to know that we are loved with an everlasting love, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that your grace is available and sufficient to strengthen us and comfort us and empower us. Knowing this, Lord, we are deeply grieved when we fail to honor you with our obedience. We love you so much, but so often we're drawn away by our own lusts, tempted by the world and the flesh to sin against you and who we are in Christ. It's in you that we live and move and have our being. Every breath we take is a gift from you. We are totally dependent upon your grace for life, and yet too often we choose our way over your way. Father, as a church... As individuals, we confess this sin of rebellion against you. We're so grateful that we can come into your presence any time with a broken and contrite heart, acknowledge our sin to you, and receive forgiveness and cleansing. We thank you that the guilt and the penalty for sin are paid by Jesus, that there is no condemnation for us who are in Christ. We thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can repent of our sin and live a life that glorifies you and testifies to Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who are sick or in need in any way. We especially today remember Rhea and Morris and Eleanor and Harold and Carl and Nancy and Paul and Janet. And we pray for our church. As a body of believers and their children, grant that our fellowship is pleasing in your sight. Grant that our commitment to teaching and preaching your word without compromise will define us in this community. Keep us diligent to guard against the influences of the world trying to weaken our stand for the truth. And give our leadership wisdom and discernment to expose and defeat the attacks of the devil as he attempts to destroy. Help us to maintain our unity as sisters and brothers in Christ, welcoming all and calling all to name Jesus as Lord and Savior. As we turn to your word, open us fully to receive what you will say to us, that by your Holy Spirit we will be enabled to act on what we receive today for the glory of Jesus, our coming King. Amen. Human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist tells us, and modern psychology has told us that some of us are wired up with a preference to enjoy structure, while others are wired with a preference to enjoy spontaneity. When it comes to big stuff, though, if we're honest, most of us are not that crazy about surprises. It might be okay to have a dozen roses or a new motorcycle, show up at the house mysteriously someday. But uh, it's probably not okay if you custom order a new car in red and it arrives in green. It might be okay to have your closest friends surprise you on your birthday, but it's probably not okay if you're catching a flight to go to your sister's wedding and you learn from the airline when you arrive at the airport that the flight has been cancelled. 
Now, some of us are better at changes of plans than others, but sometimes we're thrown for a loop. Take Joseph, poor Joseph. We don't know much about him except this. He was originally from Bethlehem, but was living in Nazareth. He was a carpenter. He was engaged to be married to Mary, a young woman who, from Nazareth who probably was quite a bit younger than him. And we learn from our scripture today that he was really a consummate gentleman. And he disappears from the scene in scripture almost as quickly as he arrives. But there are certain things we can imagine about the unknown courtship between Joseph and Mary. Their relationship may or may not have been arranged. It was pretty common in that culture to arrange marriages, though fathers tended to be more concerned to make sure that their sons got married off than their daughters for some reason. Or maybe Joseph saw Mary out the corner of his eye in synagogue one day and decided to ask her out. Maybe they met at Tim Hortons for coffee one night after work. Well, that would be difficult because it would be more than a millennium before coffee was invented (laughs) or discovered anyway. We can presume that they both loved God passionately, a, a mutuality that would strengthen their relationship and would ultimately serve them both well given what was coming. They would both have believed that the Messiah would come someday. And no doubt they would have talked around the world such as they knew and discovered the spark. And then one day, Joseph popped the question. But there was no fooling around. They both loved God and wanted to honor God with their bodies. So even after he asked and she said yes, they remained sexually pure. See, the engagement in that culture uh, was as important or in some cases more important than the wedding itself. Once you were Engaged, that was a legal transaction right there. Even though the woman remained in her father's home until the wedding. And probably they would have been engaged about a year before the wedding and the consummation of the marriage. Maybe they dreamed of this nice little thatched roof hut in the suburbs of Nazareth, overlooking the shepherd's fields with a sturdy, strong fence and a great big olive tree. Maybe they thought they'd wait a couple of years and have a boy and a girl. She'd stay home with the kids while he built up his business. Ah, the dreams of young love. But then there was a change of plans. An angel interrupted the dream and told Mary, Hey, guess what? You're going to have a baby. She wouldn't have to go on Maury Povich, though, to find out who the father was. Because the angel would tell her right then and there that it was going to be the Holy Spirit. The woman of faith that she was, she said, let it be to me according to your word, which is kind of like the biblical way of saying, okay. The angel departed, and what happened the next day? Well, probably morning sickness, certainly a sickness of heart. How would she tell Joseph He'd been so kind, so faithful, such a righteous gentleman. How could she tell him she was pregnant? And how would he react when she said, Oh, and by the way, the father is God himself. I can imagine the anticipation of telling him was painful beyond belief. And he must have been devastated at the news, even embarrassed, maybe He'd made a down payment at the banquet hall already and bought the invitations and lined up his groomsmen. Now what would he do? He had trusted her. He had loved her. He planned to spend whatever life he had left with her. Now what? Well, in that culture, the proper thing to do was to set the record straight, clear your name, and divorce the woman. And there was a good chance that she'd be stoned to death for what she had done for getting pregnant before the wedding. But what else could he do? Mary would be beside herself. She hadn't done anything wrong, but the little paunch in her belly told society otherwise. She'd said yes to God, and now Joseph would probably hate her and subject her to public humiliation. The whole world around her uh, would hate her and subject her to All of the thoughts of being a horrible person, maybe even a whore, it was just not what she'd planned. But there was 
a change of plans. This is how it unfolded. Here's Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, that is, one who is just and merciful in this context. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Well, why? Was he afraid of marrying one so highly favored? Was it because he only found out when it was obvious? It appears she's been unfaithful. No, it's because he didn't want, to, didn't want himself or her to be exposed to public shaming or Mary being stoned, which was what the law called for. Well, inspired by uh, an outline I read by Greg, Craig Rochelle, I want to suggest to you that uh, you've had a change of plans at some point in your life you probably didn't expect. Maybe you wanted to provide a good Christmas for you and your family and the car broke down. Or the house needed a new roof. Or your company downsized. Or you pledged to be faithful to your spouse for as long as you both would live, but the other person didn't take that seriously. You raised your kids as best you could and now there is rebellion. You didn't ask for migraine headaches. You didn't ask for battling depression. You didn't plan on losing a scholarship. You didn't plan on getting injured on the job. This isn't what you wanted. It wasn't the plan. And you don't understand what's going on. That could have happened or any number of other scenarios to any of us. Well, here's some encouragement for you. And this is the blanks in your notes today if you want to remember this. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. Proverbs 19 verse 21 says you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Fair enough, but you'd kind of like to know what the Lord's purpose is. Mary and Joseph's plans were ruined, but God had a purpose. So now what's going to happen? Well, this is verses 20 and 21. This is of Joseph. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, let me just camp on that for a second because we can't discount the fact that God can speak to us in dreams. But at the same time, we also can't assume that every dream is a word from the Lord when it might have just been a bad pizza the night before. The other night... I dreamt that Diana and I were sitting in a train car. Now that sounds dreamy enough for me. But what we were doing sitting in that train car was a little odd. We were eating pieces of pencil eraser from a kitty litter box. <laughs> if that's of the Lord, that's going to take some major discernment. So God can speak through dreams... But God does not speak through every dream. But in Joseph's case, this was really clear. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means the Lord saves. <laughs> Well, now what? The Lord, the Lord has a purpose, and it's going to prevail. It's a change of plans. Thank heaven for dreams, Mary must have thought, because she finally now has some corroborating evidence for her story. Still, there must have been some great frustration. But sometimes God's greatest invitations feel like our worst interruptions. Just think about that for a second. Sometimes... God's greatest invitations feel to us like the worst interruptions. God can interrupt our plans with his purpose. And it takes some time and some maturity for us to come to terms with this, right? I can't tell you how many times in ministry I've been interrupted from something that I've been doing. And most of those times it's been because God had a different purpose than what I had initially planned. 
but it can be hard to stop what you're doing, right? Because, you know, you've got deadlines, you've got agreements you've made, commitments that you've made. Other people are affected by this change of plans. But when we stop and hold the situation before the Lord, we often find that his purpose is in the midst of the interruption. When we hold all that before God, he may speak into our situation just as he did with Joseph. This is verses 22 to 25. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. Now, the Old Testament, the old Hebrew word for virgin, uh, some people have tried to say it means young woman. And it does mean young woman. But in that context, it almost always also means a young woman who is a virgin. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is right from Isaiah 7, 14. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. This way it would be entirely unambiguous to the first readers and to us that Mary was a virgin when she gave birth. And Joseph named him Jesus. Well, the dream was Joseph's game changer. He came to realize that the plans that he and Mary had made were not quite what God had in mind. Luke's gospel, of course, gives us an enhanced version of the story that shows even more frustration of human plans. Maybe they thought Mary would have a nice home birth with a midwife in the bathtub. What does she find herself doing riding a donkey or a camel or some kind of beast of burden to Bethlehem. Why? Because Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire, decided to call a census. Why would he call a census? Because his ego wanted to know how many people he ruled over in the world. But God used that. Everybody had to go back to their hometown to register, and that's why they ended up giving birth without the comforts of home, but in a cave behind a local motel in Bethlehem. That's why they ended up without a midwife, instead surrounded probably by a whole mess of curious barnyard animals. Jesus was born. And then Herod, the governor of the region, felt threatened by this baby, who was said to be the king of the Jews, so he called for a mass slaughter of infants. So God sent Mary and Joseph and Jesus off to Egypt to escape this genocide when they should have been living a normal suburban life. But that wasn't what God had planned. When something inconvenient or even painful happens to you, Are you in a place spiritually and emotionally to believe that God may have a different purpose from your own plan? Three decades later, Mary would stand at the base of a small hill, looking upon her son's strips naked, bearing inhumane treatment as he hung on a cross. This was not what she had planned for her little boy. But get this, you don't have to understand the plan when you trust God's purpose. Nobody could have predicted or planned what unfolded that first Christmas. Certainly not the faithful Jewish people. They were expecting the Messiah, but they were not expecting God to become human. They did not expect to see a Messiah as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, the same kind of cloth used to prepare someone for burial. Nobody planned for the Messiah to be born to die. And rise again. But God had a purpose. It was bigger than Mary and Joseph's plans. It was bigger than Caesar's plans. It is bigger than our plans. Whatever interruptions you're facing amid your plans, look for God's greater purpose. When it comes to Christmas, understand this. While things didn't seem to go according to plan, God had a purpose. And you are that purpose. You are that purpose. When Jesus came and was born, lived a perfect, sinless life, died, rose again, and ascended into heaven, the purpose for all of that 
was you and me. We plan to make our own lives right with God by being good. But instead, Jesus was good. We plan to make sacrifices, but instead, Jesus became the sacrifice. We plan to be righteous, but instead, Jesus was righteous because we couldn't be. That's the delight, the love of this holy season. God in Christ has done for us what we could not do on our own, and he has paid the price for our salvation. That baby born in a manger whose parents set aside their best laid plans was and is our salvation. We can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. Our plans are swept aside for his purpose and we are the beneficiaries of that for in God's good purpose eternal life is won for all who will receive Jesus, Savior and Lord. Will you put your trust in him today? Will you say to God, despite my plans, I can't live a good enough life? Will you say to God, I've tried my best, but I still sin? Will you say to God, I'm walking away from that life so I can live for you? Will you say to God, I plan to be Lord of my own life, but today I step down and invite Jesus to be Lord of my life? Look for God's purpose in your messed up plans because you are his good purpose. You don't have to understand every aspect of God's purpose to trust. God often interrupts our plans with his purpose. Now grab your connection card because I've got a few steps I want to suggest to you. It is well perforated today. You tear this off. You can fill out the front with your contact info. No spam, I promise. And then... uh, fill out the back as we're going to talk for a minute and then you can hand it to me or leave it in the basket at the connection desk. So you could say when my plans get interrupted I will look for God's purpose. Whether those plans were this week or 20 years ago take a look at what you envisioned and consider whether God had a better purpose for you. Rejoice in that and give thanks for God's purpose. And in the coming days or weeks or years when your plans are thwarted, look for God's purpose in those and submit to it. Or you can say, I realize that my plan to save myself needs to be replaced with God's purpose for me. Today I trust Jesus who died and rose again as God's purpose for me. All those questions I asked you a few minutes ago, will you say to God, da, 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 da. if you were nodding your head in your own heart and mind about that, then check that off so that I can encourage you in this newfound walk you are going to make with the Lord. Or you can say, I will invite a friend to St. Paul's because maybe now that you understand a bit more of God's purpose, you can see that Jesus is God's purpose for your friends, for your neighbors, for your co-workers, for your family, and you want them to have God's purpose. Invite them to worship here Christmas Eve. It's the time of year when people are most open to receiving an invitation to experience God's grace. Then let the Holy Spirit work as they start to really see what God's purpose for them is. I was in my early 20s pastoring a little Baptist church and thought I'd find a nice Baptist girl who could be my companion in life and ministry. That was my plan. Then one day I was returning something I borrowed from the Presbyterian pastor down the street, and his wife invited me in for tea, for their daughter was home. (laughs) She had a purpose. (laughs) She had a plan. Well, I was smitten, and... uh, I began to realize my plan and God's purpose were a little different. And so by his grace, I submitted to that purpose. And five weeks later, we were engaged to be married. There was no virgin birth involved. (laughs) But 27 years later, I'm still grateful that the Lord showed me that his purpose for me was greater than my plan. I didn't know where that would lead, but here we are. You don't have to understand the plan to trust that God has a purpose. So... Will you embrace God's change of plans?
for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your purpose is always better than our plan, even when we can't see it. Help us to trust you in it all. Thank you for Jesus, whom you sent to be born as a baby, to teach your people about your kingdom and to be our substitute on that cruel cross. Among your many purposes, thank you that salvation in Jesus was and is our greatest purpose. And so we ask you to help us trust in him as the one who died in our place who rose again to give us eternal life and will come again to receive us as his sisters and brothers in the work of your kingdom, both now and in eternity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we will sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Please stand. God in the highest, 
May we go into his world today with the peace that he invites us to have, with the love that he offers us in Jesus Christ, and with an openness to the change in plans that God may have for any of us. And may we gather again around the manger in the coming days. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us and those we love this day and always. Amen.